Dear Professors Banerjee, Duflor, and Kramer, you have introduced a way of conducting research that helps us better to understand the root causes of poverty, as well as to find effective ways of alleviating it. The experimental approach you pioneered has transformed research in development economics. The research that follows this approach... Drs. Eshkar Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, and Michael Kremer won the 2019 Nobel Prize in Economics. Their research involved an experimental approach to combat poverty and to identify specific interventions that could be taken to help alleviate it. While their research was novel, poverty itself is a problem that has been around since the advent of civilization. Today, hundreds of millions of people, including children, are affected by it. Data from UNICEF shows that 663 million children worldwide live in poverty, approximately a third of all children on Earth. But what is poverty? The United Nations defines it as, quote, a denial of choices and opportunities, a violation of human dignity. Indeed it is. Evidence shows that children born into poverty are likely to have less access to educational opportunities, proper nutrition, and proper guidance. However, they are more likely to be perpetrators or victims of crime. Furthermore, children born into poverty are statistically more likely to remain poor as adults and thus continue the vicious cycle of intergenerational poverty. How is that where a person is born, something that they had no choice whatsoever in deciding, is a factor that plays a pivotal role in determining the outcome of their lives? Here in our community, when we think of poverty, we often think of starving children in a developing nation thousands of miles away from us. We think of child laborers in the maquiladoras and sweatshops of some of the world's largest clothing brands. We think of children in war zones whose lives have been uprooted and who have now become refugees. What we don't usually think about is the poverty faced by youth in our very own backyards. Here in Leon County, and in our city, Tallahassee, Florida. Let us explore this crisis our community faces from the perspective of those that fight it every day. Let us learn about what we can do to alleviate this ill that permeates our society. To begin understanding the scope of this issue, we must first understand the uneven distribution of wealth within the state and even within our own city. Here in Florida, Approximately 900,000 children live in poverty, yet 50% of these children live in only 15% of the state's zip codes. In Tallahassee, Southside zip code 32304 has the highest youth poverty percentage in the state of Florida and among the highest in the nation at an alarming 50%. More surprisingly, if one takes a 30-minute drive north from 32304, the situation changes completely. In Northside Tallahassee zip code 32312, the average household income is $130,000, nearly four times that of 32304's. The percentage of children living in poverty is nearly 10 times less than that of 32304's. So how is there such a huge difference in wealth in such a close distance within the same city Michael Williams, director of the Florida Prosperity Initiative at the Florida Chamber of Commerce Foundation, says the following. So Leon County, which I think there's, uh, I have to count it up, but there's probably seven or eight different zip codes here that comprise the, uh, the county. Total number of children in poverty, that's under 18, so it could be high schoolers all the way down to, to infants. The total number of kids uh, in poverty, youth poverty rate is about 10,000, it's 900,999. Most of the poverty in the county is kind of centralized in one area, the south side of Tallahassee. If you took the, the poverty, the number of children in poverty in um, 32309, 32308, 
three, two, three, one, one, if you combined all those, they would still have less children in poverty than in three, two, three, or four, which is about 1,700 kids, I believe, in poverty. So again, a lot of that poverty is located um, south side and southwest side of Tallahassee. Um, there's, those are none of the, the statistics, none of the numbers should be surprising. That's the trend that we've seen. That's the reports that we've seen for years and years. It's just a matter of, of how do we go about addressing it? Because it seems like the ways that we've been addressing it may not be as effective as we need them to be. Mr. Williams is right. U.S. Census data shows that nearly 10,000 kids in Leon County are living in poverty. 6,800 of these children are residing in zip codes in the South Side. Longtime resident of Tallahassee, Mayor Pro Tempore Diane Williams Cox is intimately aware of the challenge. She elaborates on the difficulties faced by the South Side. As the Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Tallahassee, and as a commissioner, I'm, I'm, I'm charged with uh, self charge to try to figure out how we can eradicate poverty. Some of the things that we're doing is that we're identifying needs of the community. Um, in some cases, we're finding that uh, there are individuals who need education, so we're looking at providing um, services for uh, accomplishing a GED. There are those who need training to get better jobs, and so we're targeting and trying to direct them to uh, places where they can get that training, such as Lively Votech or uh, Community College or even college, and also uh, on the job training at, at work. The biggest thing, to, in my opinion, to combat po uh, poverty is to help people get money in their pockets. I'm sure it didn't happen overnight. It happened for a series of reasons. And it, it's concentrated in the census tract that um, covers the south side and even some of the uh, central downtown areas, such as uh, Frenchtown. And I think that as the communities begin to uh, collapse and businesses and, and residential um, residences um, started uh, falling into ill repair, uh, people began to move out. And so what we're trying to do is to rebuild and try to revitalize and, and make those areas better so that people will want to live there and people will want to come back. And we also want people to work with uh, our, our youth and our schools to make sure our schools are good and strong because good and strong schools will produce good and strong citizens who will help us rebuild our communities. We may ask ourselves, why does it even matter if youth poverty is concentrated on one side of town more than another. It all comes down to one thing, access to opportunity. Youth in the South Side face greater crime rates, less funded schools, and an abundance of malnourishment due to food deserts. Growing up in such conditions can make it difficult for children to look beyond their own communities and sometimes not even realize that they are in poverty. Mr. Freddie Branham, Executive Director of ECHO Faith Outreach Ministries believes that identifying poverty is one of the first steps that must be taken in order to get out of it. A lot of students might not know the poverty that they're in. I've had people come to me and say, you know, I grew up homeless and we didn't know it. You know, we slept in a car or we slept at an aunt's house or there were times when we would appear to be traveling. And it was simply because maybe rent was late, you were evicted and the family was working to to find some alternative place to stay. And to, to grow up in that without knowing what was going on when you went to bed at night, getting ready, maybe doing your homework or studying, and then knowing that your parents were struggling financially or struggling to find a job. You know, there's a lot of that that goes on that you don't even have exposure to until you either become an adult or until you're faced with something on your own. While identifying poverty is certainly the first step, access to educational opportunities is an implication of youth poverty. Mrs. Talithia Edwards, president of the Greater Bond Neighborhood Association, community advocate and chair of the Title I Advisory Board, goes on to discuss the achievement gap and the uneven playing field faced by children, even within Tallahassee. The achievement gap is Essentially, those children who are raised in low socioeconomic classes are taught to less 
than children who were raised in a higher socioeconomic status. And so that achievement gap causes a deficiency in words and literacy and reading. And, I, you know, there's a phenomenon of why that is maybe educational reasons. A lot of research have shown um, different, but there is an achievement gap. And that achievement gap is then shown in the literacy rates of the children that are living in these impacted communities. A school on the north side, their kids are entering school at about 80, 85% ready to learn. Our kids here, the same rates at Bond Elementary, they're about 23% Um, of the children are ready to enter school, ready to learn. For example, if we look at Griffin Middle School, 79% of students qualify for reduced lunches. 30% of students are reading proficient and a math proficiency of 25%. Once again, if one takes a 30 minute drive north, the situation changes. Deer Lake Middle School, in Northside Tallahassee has a reading and math proficiency that is nearly three times greater than that of Griffin's. At Deer Lake, a mere 13% of children qualify for free or reduced lunches. While this is alarming, early childhood education, an often overlooked issue, is just as important a factor in determining whether a person will be financially independent for the rest of their lives. I do believe that foundational um, learning is what the key is, access to quality, affordable childcare. And so we're lacking that on our side of town. Our superintendent, what he did was, which was great, our school board, they, um, they put into effect all day VPK for Title I schools. However, there's not enough money to actually service every child who qualifies for all day VPK. So there are children who are not in a quality learning setting. Therefore, that is only widening the gap of them being ready to come into school and learn. While education can play a pivotal role in lifting children out of poverty, sometimes poor children don't receive the resources they need to perform. Among these is access to proper nutrition. Mr. Freddie Branham, Executive Director of ECHO Faith Outreach Ministries, says the following. I mean, nutrition is key. You know, I mean, second probably only to financial security is food security. And I was fortunate to have a career prior to this one with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and and be exposed to the school lunch program. You know, when, when you look at that program for five days a week, Students that are lower income or that qualify for a free and reduced lunch get two meals a day. But then what happens when they leave and go to a family and there's the weekend? What happens when spring break hits? What happens when you guys just rolled off of a Christmas vacation for three weeks? It's like, what happens in those cases? And that's precisely what our food pantry is for. Yet many of us young people irreverently discuss the plight of starving children in a less developed nation. We often forget that hunger is closer to us than we would ever like to imagine. Mr. Douglas Cook, principal of James S. Rickards High School, a Title I school, describes the situation. Just go out and talk to the schools because we have a food pantry here at James S. Rickards High School. And I know for a fact that we have students that go to that pantry each week to take food home for the weekend. And we stock it up and the food is gone. If that's not an indication of youth poverty, I don't know what is. Nutrition indeed does play a pivotal role in academic success. Dietitian Chrissy Carroll demonstrates the cyclical relationship between poor nutrition and academic performance. Her study indicates that poor diets at young ages can cause lower academic performance, which in turn allows students to get fewer job opportunities and thus continue the cycle. Long-term impacts of this could include negative impacts on Florida businesses as well as the economy as a whole. Furthermore, 
Recent research done by the Tallahassee Democrat shows that a lack of access to cleaner food options can cause an increase in conditions such as oral hygiene issues showed was more concentrated in south side zip codes. This could further impediment the development of a child. Unfortunately, malnourishment and physical health issues are not the only health-related issues which are common for children in poverty. Mental health, something that is critical to a child's development, can also be negatively affected if a child is in poverty. NCCP data shows that one in five children in poverty face mental health challenges, something that not only affects the child's well-being, it also has a positive correlation with higher community crime rates, something that could dissuade businesses from investing in poor areas. For example, Tallahassee itself has a higher property crime rate than both Chicago and Los Angeles. While in recent years, President Trump has implemented an Opportunity Zones program that provides tax incentives to businesses that invest and revitalize low-income areas, critics believe that gentrification could be an outcome of these programs. Proponents of the program believe that it can provide small businesses and communities the opportunity to develop. As a matter of fact, the city of Tallahassee, through partnerships with local businesses, have invested millions of dollars into revitalizing the Bond and Frenchtown areas, something that could help alleviate poverty in the long run through the creation of jobs in the South Side, a change Mrs. Talithia Edwards has worked on bringing. It is also important to note that while people of all races are affected by poverty in our community, black and brown people are more likely to be affected, an indication of Tallahassee's long history with systemic discrimination. Sure, I think this country faces institutionalized discrimination, right? But specifically here in Tallahassee, we, our city government is doing a great job. One of their um, strategic, in the strategic plan, one of their um, points is impact on poverty. And so they are looking and addressing. However, this is long before our city, um, city and county commission, and even before them, this is the foundations of what this country and specifically the South is built on, right? So African Americans have disproportionately been left out of things, resources, jobs, housing, and the list can go on until we begin to address those systematic things in order to level the playing field. We're going to continue to see these poverty rates with our families and our children in, in, in our communities. Mrs. Edwards noted, the right steps are being taken, and indeed they are. Leon County School Superintendent Rocky Hanna has spearheaded efforts to develop Southside Tallahassee schools, among them Griffin and Rickards. According to the World Bank, facility improvements help foster a better learning environment, something that is a high school student at James S. Rickards. Furthermore, our local newspaper, the Tallahassee Democrat, is also working on a project to help build awareness and provide solutions to the poverty faced by youth in 32304. While our community leaders and community organizations are taking the necessary steps, what can we, as members of the community, do? As Nelson Mandela once stated, poverty is not an accident. Like slavery and apartheid, it is man-made and can be removed by the actions of human beings. Perhaps the first step is creating awareness of the issue, the fact that it is real, and the fact that it affects the future of thousands of Tallahassee children. Even students can play their part, simply by reaching out to their peers that may be going through a difficult time. Mr. Branham states, I mean, when you're studying alongside people, when you're just uh, eating with them, when you're doing high school things with them, it's there's opportunities to just be that friend, be that confidant that you never know what, what can be shared.
Mayor Pro Tempore Williams Cox shares a similar sentiment. I think that the biggest thing that you as high schoolers can do is learn about it, learn what causes it, and to also do some outreach. Uh, you have people at your school who you, you probably know or others know that are having some difficulties. So offer the support, talk to them, listen to them, find out what the needs are, and try to help connect them to resources. That's what we do here in my office. We try to connect people to resources because all resources are not from, from the government. There are other types of resources that we need to connect people to in order to help them become successful, such as educational resources, such as home, um, homelessness, to prevent that. There's a, lot, there's a plethora of um, resources that are needed and are sometimes available. People just are not aware of where to get the help. Yet despite this issue being so prevalent in our city, we still hear common misconceptions about it. One of the most common being that poor people are just lazy. This is an idea that must be dispelled. I think laziness uh, is, is not, uh, not bound to one social stratosphere. I know plenty of wealthy people who are, you know, they have lazy tendencies. Um, I don't think any, I don't think anybody is just lazy as their main uh, characteristic of their life. Um, I do think that, that there are people who don't take advantage of opportunities that they're given. Um, and that doesn't apply just to the poor, that applies to middle class, that applies to the, to the wealthy. Um, education is the, is the one single most common denominator in determining success or failure. If you have a high school diploma, you're, uh, you're able to guarantee the, a certain level of, of economic independence. If you add on a college degree or a trade certification, you're guaranteed even more. But when you're uh, when your um, education is below that, you are almost certain to experience some form of poverty in your life, whether that's long-term poverty or short-term. Um, the education is, uh, that you receive is, is the number one factor that we see. By engaging, educating, and building awareness, our community can take the necessary steps to solve this multifaceted problem. We can engage through the collaboration between schools, community partners, universities, and businesses to develop work-based programs for at-risk children. Educational opportunities. By exploring possibilities to engage with educational institutions, our community can make education a reality for many children. Finally, something all of us can do, building awareness. Through the development of peer networks, fundraisers, networking events, and simply reposting content on social media, we can ensure that fellow members of our community are aware of this crisis faced by thousands of children. We believe the future belongs to the youth of today. Yet we need adults and leaders in the community that are willing to engage and listen to the voices of the youth to ensure that Tallahassee zip codes are not known for their stories of despair, but are rather filled with hope for the future.